Alright, we're going to try and do this from home. Had a very large snowstorm and so we're not having the service uh, at the chapel tonight. Uh, just too much for everybody so uh, uh, we're going to re record this at home. Uh, I'm in the kitchen as opposed to usually I've done this in the office. Uh, office is uh, being used for other things for the moment so uh, we're going to do our Wednesday evening Bible study from here. So I hope the lighting's not too crazy for you. Uh, and we're going to go from there. So let's pray first, and then we'll get right into the lesson. And Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your great many blessings, Lord. Uh, truth be told, Lord, we needed the storm. We need the snow. We need the precipitation, Father, uh, to refill the aquifers, the wells. Uh, and as difficult, Lord, as it sometimes can make things for us here, uh, this is New England, we're hardly uh, uh, strangers to snowstorms and, and these sorts of things. Lord, bless this lesson, Father, we pray. Lord, now as we continue our study in the book of Philippians, uh, I pray, Lord, that it will be an encouragement Lord, and edification and the blessing, Lord, to those that hear it. And we pray and we ask for this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter 4 is where we're at. And we are going to be doing just one single verse this evening. Because there's just so much there in that verse. So Philippians 4 verse 8 is where we're at. And here the scripture says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things things. Uh, that's a tremendous passage of scripture that we're going to be looking at this evening. So firstly, whatsoever things are true, truth. In John 18, in verse 38, Pontius Pilate very arrogantly responds to the Lord Jesus Christ, what is truth? And he does this after Jesus Christ has made the statement, Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Showing quite plainly that Pontius Pilate was not among those. Then in the previous chapter in John, as the Lord is praying to the Father, he states, there in John 17 17 sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth the very beginning place for truth then must both begin and end with the words of God this is why we hold the Bible so dear and why we guard it so doggedly as we do now if, if the true words of God only exist in the plenary originals which only a very few ever had access to uh, in their life and only certain ones during certain parts of their life depending upon when they lived then what is it then on which we stand uh, the originals don't exist and haven't some of them haven't existed for thousands of years if God has not kept and preserved his words for us 
exact, correct, and without addition or loss through the ages, exactly as he promised that he would do, then I submit he is no God at all. Excuse me there for a minute, I have to, uh, the power cord on the camera isn't working quite right, so I'm trying to make sure I got power going in there. Alright, I, I mean, it, God says, I will preserve my words, I will purify my words, and then he didn't do it, then, yep, that's the computer turning on, that's where my power's coming from. How is he God? How could he be God? Uh, it, it it just would would make no sense if that were the case. I mean, if I can't hold a book in my hand and do it with the absolute confidence that what I hold in my hand are the very and true words of God, then what's the point behind all that we do? Now, we've settled this, you know, at our church at least, and many others, uh, we've settled this for ourselves, and we're all confident on where we stand <coughs> and where we have planted our feet. Therefore, we have a final authority in our lives that governs both the spiritual and the natural. And it's this authority by which we measure and we compare all things, thus allowing us to have the knowledge of what is truth and what is not. Anyone who tries to sell you on conflicting authorities and personal preference is a snake. Okay, and they're a snake of the highest order, and I'd shun him or her the same way as I would shun the devil himself. There is so much that we can definitively know through the truth that there's absolutely no reason for any saint to have to walk in darkness in this life. No excuse. Not at all. There are some things that will require much prayer and study to know. There are even fewer things that, quite frankly, we cannot know. Uh, they're not written in the scriptures for us, for the church. And so they're not going to be revealed to us. Uh, they're for folks that are yet to come in the tribulation and maybe on into the millennium. Uh, but the great volume of what is available for us to know, we have the responsibility to seek it out and to acquire it. And what a great shame it is. It's going to be a great shame for a great many when they get to glory and they're going to find out that they could have definitively known right now during their mortal walk things that they chose not to know or believe that they could not know during this life, expecting to only learn it and discover it once they arrived at home. Things that are honest. Uh, this falls very much in the same category as the previous, which is truth. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 with me. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Don't get over there. 
hard for me to see at this angle. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Somehow that doesn't sound like the right passage to me. What am I looking for here? Second Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Yeah, no, I'm in the right spot. Yeah, it says, by having, uh, we faint not, by having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Truth and honesty go hand in hand. Dishonesty, deception, subterfuge, misdirection, uh, all these things are the offspring of lies and are the tools used by liars, right along with subtlety and beguilement. If it is honest, then it's wholesome, and it is good, and it will be strengthening, and it will be uplifting, and it will be edifying, and it will be comforting. If it causes unwarranted questions, unwarranted doubts, divisions, all contrary to sound doctrine, I have nothing to do with it. We do not stand where we do doctrinally as we have for over 25 years and through three pastors based on cunningly devised fables, the wind of doctrine, doctrines of devils or profane and old wives fables but having a more sure word of prophecy which was once delivered to the saints and it's why we are so firm on our doctrine unwilling to allow the slightest Variation in it as a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Honesty. Honesty is how we are to behave ourselves with the Lord, with our own selves, with the church, and with the world. Honesty is a part of your character. And you need to guard your character vigorously. Now our reputations, those are in the hands of men. And men will say about you what they choose. And uh, manipulate <laughs> your uh, reputation. Okay, But only you control your character. Pure. Purity, in this context, has to do with one's behavior spiritually and naturally, or carnally. And there's so much out there to corrupt you both spiritually and naturally. Therefore, you must take great care, great pains to ensure that what you take in, what you allow to influence you, does not corrupt, but that it benefits, it enhances, and it purifies. Pure-hearted, pure-minded, pure in motives, actions, words, thoughts. To be pure and morally straight 
as we used to quote in our Boy Scout uh, motto back when I was a Boy Scout, when Boy Scouts were boys and were straight, uh, is the expectation of anyone who is godly minded. So one guards against polluting oneself spiritually, mentally, and physically by whatsoever things are pure. That's how we guard against whatsoever things are impure, vulgar, filthy, vile, profane, just. Whatsoever things are just. What is just and what is right is clearly outlined in the scriptures for us. The scripture often speaks of doing justice and judgment. And that justice and judgment is to be righteous according to God's definition of righteousness. Just as with Pilate's mocking question of what is truth, so the world is going to question, well, what is just? You know, the ultimate questioning of this is when they question God condemning souls through the eternal lake of fire. Some will argue that it is unjust and unloving. Therefore, in spite of and contrary to what the scriptures say, they state that a loving God would never send anyone to perdition. Others like the late Billy Graham, claim that, no, it's just separation from God, that there is no eternal lake of fire. Some will accept hell, but will deny the eternal lake of fire, claiming that the rebellious lost have suffered enough. God wouldn't do that. Well, again, you're, you're calling God a liar then. Second Peter 3, nine says, The Lord is not slack, concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord's justice is incredibly and impeccably fair. The Lord has provided means of being just before God ever since he placed man on the earth. And he has made that provision clear to men in every dispensation. Hell was created not for men, but for the devil and his angels, who in their arrogant pride and rebellion deserve the condemnation that they have received. Man only finds himself there if he rejects God's gracious provision and arrogantly rebels with the father of lies. And contrary to John Calvin's heresy, if God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, then every person from Adam to the baby that's being born this very second have the just and fair opportunity to be redeemed of God. Now in light of that, you place yourself in the position of the Godhead at the great white throne judgment. God the Father sacrificed His only begotten Son to redeem men. Jesus Christ, the Word of God, leaves the glory and adoration of heaven and becomes a man. He lives a righteous and just life and then willingly and voluntarily suffers the death of the cross and the torments of hell on mankind's behalf to provide a means of salvation, justification, and reconciliation for every human being. The Holy Spirit of God 
on his ascension comes to earth to be the reprover of men's hearts and to testify to them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. This redemption has been offered as a free gift through the grace of God simply by exercising faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then someone who rejected that gift of divine love rejected the repeated offerings of mercy and of love, rejected every single bit of light shown on them again and again, then stands before God Almighty and is condemned to eternal damnation in the lake of fire. This is unjust and unfair? I don't think so. Number five. Those things that are lovely. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in the Song of Solomon, is altogether lovely. He is the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. And he doeth all things well. Things that are lovely. And if it is going to cause your heart and your mind to be turned to and fixed upon Him, think on these things. Read these things. Listen to these things. And if they do not, then reject them out of hand. Okay, at the very least, or excuse me, at the very best, of that, their their dross, their vanity. At their worst, they are demonic and hellish. Don't waste time with them. Number six, of good report. Again, things of good report are those things that, upon hearing them, stir your heart to joy and to praise of God. Things like answered prayer, souls being saved, the prodigal, as we preached on Sunday, being reclaimed, and most important above all things, the Lord himself being glorified. Those are things of good report. And it finishes, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, we're so very often, we, we allow our hearts, we, and we allow our minds to be occupied, overwhelmed with the vanity and emptiness of the things of this world, the things of this life. We must learn to daily meditate upon the true, the honest, the just, the pure, the lovely, those things of good report, those things that are virtuous, those things that are praiseworthy. Otherwise, all that's left to you then is what the devil, what Satan has to offer to those that follow him. And the very best that he can offer you is an eternity spent with him in the eternal lake of fire. So that's where we're going to wrap up our study for this evening. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Lord willing, next Wednesday uh, we'll be back in the chapel. Uh, for all we know, the snow will be melted and it'll be 70. <laughs> Welcome to New England, right? All right, I love you all. Uh, we're praying for you constantly. Uh, Lord willing, we'll all be together again this Sunday morning.
Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your very many, many, many blessings, Lord. You're very good to us. You watch over for us. You care for us. Lord, you put things in place, sometimes years, sometimes decades in advance of when we're going to need things, when we're going to need things to happen. It never ceases to amaze me, Lord, the depth of your care and your watchfulness. So well, again, I pray for everybody, uh, Lord, uh, that it was a, a big storm. Uh, I don't want anybody to get hurt, Lord. don't want anybody to have a heart attack. Uh, Lord, just help them to uh, get cleaned out. And Lord, uh, I pray that everybody will take the time to sit down, Lord, and to watch the video, listen to Father for what you provided. And Lord, we thank you for all these things, Lord. Lord, with joy and with praise, in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.